innovation is a lot of things. It's in the classical pathway of research. It's in the um, implementation of new technologies into your work. Um, it is intrapreneurship. In other words, innovation in the uh, organizational process and the way that things work, maybe in the technology that you use and things become more digital. And the part that I focus on is the invention of new things. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley, in partnership with Lomitech, and sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Upwest, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, and Birthright Excel. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Let's talk about innovation in healthcare. Meet Lior Pearl, founder and director of the Rabin Medical Innovation Center and senior cardiologist. He also serves as the medical director of Victorious Medical Technologies and as the chairman of Powerful Medical's scientific board. Before these roles, Lior completed his fellowships in interventional cardiology and the biodesign innovation program at Stanford University. Lior is a dedicated physician who complements his work with research and innovation, striving to identify global medical needs and implement solutions for these within the vibrant Israeli ecosystem. Lior Perl, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm great. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited uh, for us to have this conversation over the next 20 minutes. You are the Chief Innovation Officer of the Rabin Medical Center at Clalit Health Services. Uh, I, I love talking about healthcare. I love talking about technology. I love talking about the innovation that brings uh, the two together. And so, Leo, before we even get started talking about what you do today, you, you're coming with from, from the med- medicine side, not from the technological side. Tell me a little bit about your entrance into the medicine world and how you shifted towards thinking more about innovation, less about the cardiology. Sure. Um, well, I, I think I wanted to be a doctor uh, as long as I can remember. I specifically remember drawing a fake heart to my grandmother uh, trying to prove to her that I, I understand cardiology already at the age of six or seven <laughs> and only to, wow. to be by the parents and to be embarrassed. Uh, I didn't think she'll show it to them. And I kn- I knew they knew that I don't know how a heart, uh, anyway, this is, this was on my mind early on. I later became a, a paramedic and then I really saw what things are like in the military. And I, I decided medicine is definitely something I want to um, take part of in cardiology, specifically interventional cardiology, is an opportunity I, opportunity I, 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 can take, I, I can take part of uh, by, by actually difference in, in, in patients who are extreme situations. So that's, that's really a privilege, uh, absolutely. I think my, my background goes back to my parents who were uh, different from one, one from the other. Uh, in several ways. My father was a, a science academic background uh, that really influenced me. And my mo- mother is a brilliant uh, creative artist uh, who sees the world in colors and shapes and, and sounds and uh, emotions in a way that uh, really affected all of us. And I think uh, that, that definitely made a difference on how I, I look at the world myself. So the creativity part was always something I was, I was drawn to. Um, and then during my training, I, uh, I took part of several innovative processes. Uh, you know, Israel is, is an amazing startup uh, uh, state, right? Uh, small empire of innovation and, and creativity. And I, I was very fortunate to come across a few projects, had a few ideas of my own, and I discovered how, how impactful a medical startup is in an innovative process. And, uh, and I really became in love with that as well. So I decided things. When I did my training in the U.S., I trained in interventional cardiology, in cardiology at Stanford. And then I moved on to, to another training program, which is called the Biodesign. And uh, that really teaches the way um, you can move, propagate innovation within the medical, within the healthcare system. 
Now, I, I, I would love to hear a little bit of what, what it means from an organizational perspective like Kalit or the Robin Medical Center. What does it mean to even consider innovation in this space? And, and then how does that fit into your role as Chief Innovation Officer? All right. That's a great, great question. I mean, one of the things that um, organizations and, and people are asking themselves um, is, what is innovation? Um, what, what constitutes innovation? Look at the number of innovation. If you do a search on our um, medical journals or Google Scholar and search for the word innovation, and an exponential growth in the last 10 years. And many of these things are basically research academic institutions and so on that change their names to, to innovation and now everything is research and innovation. I think that uh, innovation, innovation is a lot of things. It's in the classical pathway of research. It's in the um, implementation of new technologies into your work. Um, it is intrapreneurship. In other words, innovation in the uh, organizational process and the way that things work, maybe in the technology that you use and things become more digital. And the part that I focus on is the invention of new things. And that sometimes is the hardest thing to do. So in other words, um, what they're focused on is finding new opportunities for inventions, find large unmet clinical needs, unmet needs within the, the healthcare system. And um, see if there is an opportunity to uh, we research the, the need and we look at the process, we look at the problem and, and judge it from different angles. And we try to see if this is something that we can and should invent a new technology too. Again, based on the need itself and not so much on the technology. Uh, and then we move on to actually brainstorming and inventing. So... To me, the epicenter of innovation is the part that has to do with invention. It's the part that has to do with finding new technologies, new solutions to large unmet needs. And so within the Clalit and the Rabin Medical Center, what we focus on is all of these things, but the, the, again, the, the core essence is the innovation lab, which works to recognize unmet needs, to characterize them, um, to see the opportunity to collaborate on finding new technologies to brainstorm and to invent. And other than that, within the a large hospital like ours and obviously the Clalit, there are other aspects, such as in the assimilation of new technologies, in the collaboration with other companies who try to research their own inventions for the first time within our hospital, and, and within research. Uh, specifically in the big data and AI world, there's, it's really a spectrum. You start with research, you do these large ideas based on data, and they sometimes translate into actual solutions and actual implementation or digital tools. But in many cases, they remain research, and that's fine as well. So it's, there's a connection between all of these things. Um, and at the Rabin Medical Center, uh, we, we work on all of these aspects. And so can you give me a few specific examples of how then you come as an integrator and, and test out these new technologies, these new opportunities, and, and perhaps even one that, you know, made an impact, whether it's called lead or something that could potentially make an impact moving forward? Yes, absolutely. Actually, last week, we did our second um, anniversary of the Innovation Lab. We presented six wow. wonderful projects at the, uh, uh, at the Paris uh, Center for Peace and Innovation. And we've, and the thing is, we are open to anyone coming in here, specifically clinicians or employees, or whether it be physicians or nurses or uh, technicians, anyone who recognizes a problem and they have a burning desire to, to solve that problem because they're going to work for it, right? Because they, they, and we'll actually, um, mentor them and do this process of needs characterization, needs finding, and move on to, um, to brainstorming and invention. So some of you are a, a resident in training in neurology who came in with the, the problem of strokes during surgeries. 
So a through vascular events, as we call our accidents, as we call them in a more scientific manner, but strokes occur in many cases within the hospital, unfortunately. And it's easy to, well, it's easier to diagnose it when it, a patient comes in, the family surrounds them, um, and it, they're, they're wide awake, and we can judge if there are any neurological def- deficits. But when a patient is mm. un- undergoing surgery, um, under anesthesia, um, and um, there's really no one to talk to, they are at risk of having this event only to be diagnosed too late, two or three hours later when the patient is already extubated or breathing by themselves, and the sedation or the anesthesia is not uh, uh, efficient anymore. So we're going to uh, algorithms to look at the patient and test their motor or uh, muscle reactions, as well as their facial recognition patterns, and to actually be able to diagnose a case of stroke in a timely manner during the surgery, during the procedure. Um, if you're able to do that, you'll finish mm-hmm. quickly whatever you're doing, and you probably will be able to treat that patient who's in the hospital to begin with. So that's a huge problem, and we quantified it in terms of suffering, first of all, in terms of uh, the burden to the patient, the families, the cost, and the fact that there there are no solutions to that problem. And I think we have something running that's uh, very promising, and we're already testing it. So um, that's one example. We've got uh, quite a few more. Each year we're running tens of projects, out of which... um, few make it all the way to the end and uh, are, first of all, composed of a good team because the team is the number one component of any, any good invention, right? Any good company. And then the, 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 the problem and the solution makes sense and have a uh, hold a promise to, to a worldwide, a global solution. Um, and so every, every year we have a few of those that, uh, that we're trying to build up here. And so then what happens right after that step? So after, after you've been working with them, you're presenting them, what, what, what actually happens from that moment forward? All right, so that's, that's an interesting question because it really, it really changes between one uh, inventor to the other. Some might want to take um, and become founders, right? And that's true. That or a nurse wanted to be part of an invention process like that and looks at the startup for something that's uh, financially viable and so on. Their ex founders will, will be very glad if, if that happens. But even those are good CEOs and someone engineering to, to drive these things forward. The tip is, right, these are full-time uh, hospital employees, uh, doctors, nurses, technicians, and so on. They will want to, to maintain their full-time job. They will become consultants and um, uh, you know, uh, innovation hubs in Israel, or be driven by someone else, a CEO. So collaboration is really an important part of, of this process. And and what is it, how how are the physicians and clinicians receptive to these new innovations? Are they you know excited about their presentations? Are they excited about the new opportunities they're presenting? Do they may, maybe feel threatened by by the by you know new standards and new ways of doing things? Oh well. Uh- well, uh, <laughs> here's the thing. They're, they're used to presenting most of these, I mean, at least the physicians, but they're, they're, they live in an academic environment. They know how to present medical research. But when it comes to, to a, a pitch for a new startup, which is what we teach them to do, we actually work on a lo- logo and, and a brand and the name, and they have to make a case. 
what they're presenting is not just an academic discussion or, or, or a poster or a, a research they've worked on. This is these physicians and you know, but this is actually give a pitch to a crowd and the crowd um, in that event, but in general, because they'll meet a lot of investors and business people and so on. It's, it's a different experience and it's, in, in fact, it's one of the things that we want to teach and we want these folks to experience the world of entrepreneurship. They, they are drawn to that uh, and we give them the opportunity to, to try it for, for real. So, yes, they're excited. They're, they're outside of their comfort zone. They sometimes start with a terrible pitch, a good scientific description of the medical field, but does not speak to the crowd, right? It, it makes no sense to someone who is not a physician or even in that specific uh, field of expertise. And we'll, you know, pull them back and say, listen, we no one understands what you're, let's start with pictures. Let's be more, you know, let's be more explanatory. Let's be more um, obvious and make us understand why this is important. Uh, don't use scientific terms, but use layman language and, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth and build a story so we work on the pitch. Right. So the, I mean, the, the presentation itself is, is a skill, you know, it's interesting, it's fun, it's good to learn, but the real exciting part is the fact that we understand or we help them translate their medical needs into a language that someone can actually identify with and potentially solve um, and that and that's exactly the bridge that we're trying to, to work on. So, Lior, take me back a little bit to your childhood again. And you know, you meant you started by sharing your fascination with you know the being a doctor and creating that fake heart. But but what really sparks your curiosity even about this segment? So, wh where does the fascination really come from? It is. It's it's unbelievable. The it's, with people. Brilliant doctors or, or nurses, um, um, PT, we have all sorts, but these brilliant clinicians who understand their field very well and are experts in their field and have the will uh, and the desire to change the world. I mean, people use that phrase, but this is these are the folks who can actually change it because they, they, they are cutting edge in their field of expertise. Right. Um, and when they come in with, with a dream, most of these are failures, right? I'm sorry to say it. it no, we don't judge them as failures, uh, but we, we, we realize that this is a non-viable need in terms of financial you know, market size. It's just the way it is. Sure. If, you can't, if you can't build a, a running company, then you won't build solutions it's just that's the reality uh um or it's already out there and they didn't know that uh, there are patents that uh, block them or there's that exists out there that's kind of competing in a way that you know it's not worth walking that path or it's just too difficult but uh but the process of looking at these people coming in um with ideas with needs and actually trying to make it happen it's the best reality TV show that, uh, that I've ever seen. And it's live for us. I love it. And when they actually succeed, and when, when they actually make it happen, and they stand in front of a crowd with, with, a, with a compelling story, right? And they are the experts to actually tell it. They have the empathy to the patients more than anyone else. They've seen it once and again. Um, and they've gone through the process with us, and they actually ca came out from the other way with, a, a, a mock-up or a prototype of a solution, I mean, that's just, uh, it's mind-blowing. And it's exciting every time. And I think that's what I'm drawn to. Um, it doesn't make sense in other ways. It makes more sense to actually work only on the, on the private practice. Let me, let me tell you. But it's just, it's larger than life. And so that's what I'm drawn to. I love it. Very, very cool. Uh, and uh, you also answered, obviously, my question about your, your inspiration today. But what are three words that you would use to describe yourself? Three words that I use to describe myself. Um, I'm critical. Uh, uh, I guess I'm full of uh, excitement and motivation. And I always, I always listen to my wife. 
Is that a word? <laughs> I'll take I'll take it as a word. I'll I'll definitely take it as a word. Leo, toda raba. <laughs> there you go thank you very very much for the time and energy i really appreciate it this was a lot of fun and uh, thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing uh, and i can't wait to follow the journey and 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 to meet some of these amazing companies and thank you for everything and stay safe and stay healthy thank you michael it's been a pleasure and i, I i'm a, an you. admirer of your of the series of people that you interview you. uh keep up the great work and and thank you very much for having me